you guys remember a VCR? You guys remember DVD players? Do you guys remember those SLR cameras? And people said, they're never going to go away. And actually, I can remember when the digital cameras came about and you went and got a picture taken from a photographer, he'd say, I use this old thing. This is really more precise than a digital camera. And then, when these guys started using digital cameras, you guys have digitals? Yes, they're both nodding their heads. That means that technology is dead, right? Even he doesn't want to buy that thing. He's taking 50 pictures. He'll go home and say, sorry, you don't need to be a really good photographer anymore. Now you can 500 pictures. You pick the five good ones you want. Right? Sorry. No offense. So he's taking more pictures. So, um, the point I'm trying to make is that this sounds like science fiction, but it is not science fiction because in five to eight years from now, you'll look back and say, holy shit, what was I thinking? Right? You've done that with digital cameras. You've done it with, with DCRs. Um, I read a very nice report the uh, day before yesterday. We talked about how people are going to consume music in the future. And I think the writer was being generous. Say, of course, people are going to keep buying CDs. The only reason I buy a CD is to take it home, put it on my computer so I can take it down on my iPod. That's the only reason I buy a CD. Right? So I don't know how long people are buying CDs. And as these gigabit connections show up, I'm not sure how long I'm going to buy a DVD for. I don't know how to keep track of it. I don't know how to get it to work in my... Even my car has an iPod dock. So I just take my music to my iPod and connect my iPod to my car. I don't have to worry about putting a CD in that thing because I never know which CD is in my car, which is not. So if you think about this, this is actually not science fiction. This is all going to happen in the next five to eight years. We always tend to... Uh, let me get this right. Underestimate the long term and overestimate the short term. So you always think something's going to happen much sooner in the next year, but you always don't believe what's going to happen in the next ten years. In the past, if you look at the music industry, and I'll come back to media in a second... Uh, if you look at the music industry, they will tell you, if they go find 300 artists, about 30 make money and 270 lose money for them. That's the portfolio spread of every music company. So what happens is they find 30 good artists who will do fantastically well, and they will renegotiate their contracts. But the other 270, they go, they walk up to somebody, they find somebody who does a great job, they say, I'll give you a million dollars, come make an album. Then they go to somebody else, they'll make five million dollars, come make two albums, and I was the CEO of a music company in New York a few weeks ago. And his comment was, I have three artists right now whose second album is not going to work. And he paid them all $5 million. Some of them, some of it went to their heads, some of it went up their nose or whatever um, they choose to do with it. But it's a tough business. It's a portfolio business. Now compare and contrast that with in the future, if all these young artists were putting their videos on Facebook or YouTube and they already collected a million or two million or five million followers, then it becomes pretty easy, right? Then we become like photographers. We don't need to figure out who's a good artist or not. Just find somebody who's got a lot of people listening to them. They must be good. So the model changes. And the model changes over the course of our lifetimes. That's happening to the music industry. The same thing will happen to different industries in different ways, shapes, or forms. If you look at the newspaper industry or the, the content production industry as it relates to the printed word, in the past, we'd be at this conference or we'd be at a press conference by a company and or a president's pictures we saw would be doing a big event and you'd find 400 journalists would fly in from around the world and they would copiously write down everything. They'd go back to their countries and they'd put it in the local newspapers. And then they would print it and they would distribute it to people's doorsteps and that's how we'd get our news. Today, those 300 people, first of all, not 300 show up because there's no need for 300. But even the 100 who show up, within a few minutes, they've actually put their article on the Internet. So as a consumer, all of us now have a choice of finding 100 different articles about the same topic, which just happened, which is a challenge. In that world, you have to figure out how do you distinguish yourselves from the other 99 articles and how do you create a consistent brand in that context. And I was saying to Rohit earlier, uh, the Internet is to newspapers what newspapers are to magazines, or newspapers were to magazines. Because magazines were thoughtful pieces which were produced after a week or after a month, while newspapers were churned every day. The Internet is now being churned every minute, and a newspaper is a thoughtful piece at the end of the day. And it's going to change the way the newspaper industry works, whether it happens now, whether it happens in the next few years, happens earlier in the U.S., happens later in different parts of the world. So... If you look at the mobile industry, we have different challenges over there. You know, devices are going to change. Latency is going to change. The way they design apps is going to change. The way they get connectivity is going to change. So you understand that you know, this phenomena is not restricted to a few industries. It is actually going to impact 
almost every industry out there, perhaps not the mining and metal industry, if you still have to go or the construction industry, but even there, people might choose to do things differently in the way we, they deal with their workforce, you know, collaborating with their workforce or doing the instant visualization that John was talking about earlier. So it is going to have far-reaching impacts. It is going to touch every industry out there. Um, oh, yeah, and one last thing. It is going to change the way politics is conducted. And what's interesting is if you think about the recent elections in the Western world, uh, many of the people who have been elected uh, in the Western world have actually used the Internet to create a fan following. Many of them have actually hired Facebook managers. And now President Obama takes questions from YouTube. It's the first time that one of our product managers who is now moving to New York and he thinks he needs his own studio because he got to interview President Obama because uh, we allowed citizens in the United States to post videos asking questions to President Obama. And he decided to take 20 questions from YouTube and then we had a moderator who asked the 20 questions were asked by the citizens. Right? And what, now what's beginning to happen is there are certain senators and certain members of uh, uh, various constituencies in the United States who are keeping a live web page and asking for their voter feedback on a bill before they go to Congress and vote on it. Which means you're no longer an elected representative and you should just say what you think. You can actually go back in every issue because of the cheapness of technology, because of the ability of technology to give you instant feedback. You could actually get feedback from people right now and then have the opportunity to go vote in their direction. Which is a very different way of managing a democracy than the way it's been done in the past. So with that, I'm going to stop. I could go on forever. And I'm going to let Rohit ask questions because he said he had many. But thank you very much for your time and thank you for listening. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nikesh. <coughs> uh, we are running a little behind schedule, so I'll open the sort of floor to the questions. If you can keep your questions short and identify yourself, it will help. Um, you can just raise your hands and I'll reach out to you. Um, just one small factual uh, thing, Nikesh, I wanted to check with you. I, I heard that if one were to decide uh, to watch all the videos uploaded on the YouTube today, it will take 600 years to watch. All that you have done. Is that true? If your eyesight sustains, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it may be longer. It, it, we, uh, people upload 20 hours of video every minute. Okay. So it might take you longer than 600 right, years because right, people so will still be uploading while you're watching. While you're watching. I was yeah. probably clear. Kali, no, I have. I think the lights are coming on us. I can't hear it. Kali. Hi. Out of all the things that Google is working on, what is that next big thing? Okay, Google. I don't know. I, think, I thought I answered the question right at the beginning. We, we don't know. There's 20,000 people working on different things. Usually what I say, if people say, are you sure you're not working on this? I say, I don't know. There are people at Google who could be working on it. But I think it's a very fascinating world. I think we're at the beginning of a lot of changes. I don't think we're, we're anywhere close to done. And I think, uh, you know, we have very, some very interesting projects going on in technology in the browser world. We have a new phone out there. So we're working on the technology side. We have cloud applications. Uh, we're working on lots of interesting consumer stuff, which is already out there. So every day, different challenge, different industry, different product. Has anyone got you working with them uh, on any of their projects? Has that, sorry, do that again? Has any of the other Googlers got you working with Me? them on a project? Like, did you go into a conference room where somebody presented an idea and you said, I'll work with you? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, I think... Can uh, you talk about that? I think video is the next big thing. You I think if you think about... Uh, I think in the next five to eight years, about 50% of the content, 30 to 50% of the content in the world will be consumed digitally. That's a big shift. If you look at the world, it's a $700 billion advertising industry. If you add below-the-line marketing, it's about a trillion-dollar industry. If 50% of the content is going to get consumed digitally, I'm hoping some proportion of that trillion dollars move to, moves to digital. So I know Roy already thinks we make obscene amounts of money, but uh, <laughs> you know, we think $20 billion is a small drop in a trillion-dollar industry. Right. So... I'm hoping that shift of content is going to create new advertising opportunities. In that context, yes, I am working with a bunch of people. See, let's say you had a question. 
today. Can you please? Okay. Uh, Nikesh, I'm an ardent follower of Google, so don't get Thank me wrong you. if my question is a little critical. Two quick questions. You, you may have the honor of asking the last question, so <laughs> go ahead. Okay, so, which is why I think it's best if it's critical. All right. uh, I got the Nexus one on day one. Uh, the good. phone is one of the worst phones, as has been described by Walt Mossberg and others. It doesn't do many things which phones 10 years before it could do, including simple things like syncing with Outlook. Your order processing system completely failed you. Even today, there are customers waiting for support answers to come by, which were posted three weeks earlier. I'm one of them. So the process you mentioned of an idea going through in Google, weren't these things which someone caught on to early in the game, or are you willing to admit no. for the first time that Google has screwed up big time with this phone? Oh, I, I don't think <laughs> screwing up big time is... Uh... And Goldman Sachs uh, yesterday slashed your uh, sales forecast down to less than a she million. She let him answer, I think. She... Uh, you know what, I, don't, I used to be an analyst, so I don't believe anything they say or do, so don't worry about them. But... Uh, um, in the context of Nexus One, yes, we had some teething problems. In fact, we have teething problems in almost every product that we launch because, as I said, if you try and launch early and launch often, you are not going to get everything right. The question is, do you have the ability to go and fix it and make it work? Uh, we are constantly improving search. We're constantly improving every product. We launched a product called Buzz, which created a buzz, not the right kind of buzz we wanted, but we've been able to go out and fix it. So uh, many of the things you talk about in Nexus One have been fixed. Um, I didn't carry the first two Google phones. This is one phone which I carry, and I'm seriously contemplating giving up my BlackBerry. Sorry. Thanks, Nikesh. Uh, I'll give you one last question. Sorry. <coughs> well, that will be our last question for the session. I'm afraid we're really running out of time. Yeah, if you could kindly keep your question really short. Okay. Thank you. Um, in the world of increased targeting, because Google's business model is all about targeting, targeting, targeting and then delivering services that you want to have when you want to have them. Are we as human beings going to miss out on the surprises of life in that world and things that we don't know about? Mm -hmm. The random, the random stuff. Um, you know, two different answers, one from a consumer behavior perspective and another one from a Google perspective. From a consumer behavior perspective, you actually are less open to change than you think you are. And you just go through your day and just see how many things that you do in a day are new and how many things you do are a force of habit or you've been doing for a long time. And I promise you that if you get past 85 to 90 percent, or if you get below 85 to 90 percent, I'll be surprised. So people actually don't want more than 10 or 15 percent change. And as we get older, that number actually reduces. But that notwithstanding, our business model is not about targeting. Our business model is trying to anticipate what you're looking for, which is very different from targeting. So we look at behaviors, we look at search queries, we look at things that people are doing, saying, what is this person trying to look for? And I'll give you a simple example. If in the morning, 500 people search for Britney Spears and something's happened to her, and out of that, 400 people clicked on that link, which actually dictates that something happened to her, and then link is number five, we will move it to number one, right? Because that is trying to anticipate and predict what other people's input has given us, has told us about what you might be looking for. So we're trying to be more predictable or more anticipatory of what you do, as opposed to target you and box you in. Does that help mm -hmm. answer the question? My apologies, Nikesh, first to you, please be here. And my apologies to all the audience. We'll have to stop here because I believe our union minister is, is, is knocking at our doors and he has to go back to the parliament. He's our next speaker. Thank you, uh, Nikesh. And thanks, just to sum it up, thank God we have Google. Thank you. Thank you. I would request Mr. Arun Puri to kindly come on stage and present the India Today Conclave 2010 Momentum. If you want to follow him further, you can just follow his...